Section 1. Listening Comprehension. In this section of the test, you will have an opportunity to demonstrate your ability to understand conversations and talks in English. There are three parts to this section. Answer all the questions on the basis of what is stated or implied by the speakers you hear. Do not take notes or write in your test book at any time. Do not turn the pages until you are told to do so. Part A. Directions. In Part A, you will hear short conversations between two people. After each conversation, you will hear a question about the conversation. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Listen to an example. On the recording, you hear, That exam was just awful. Oh, it could have been worse. What does the woman mean? In your test book, you read, A. The exam was really awful. B. It was the worst exam she had ever seen. C. It couldn't have been more difficult. D. It wasn't that hard. You learn from the conversation that the man thought the exam was very difficult and that the woman disagreed with the man. The best answer to the question, what does the woman mean, is D. It wasn't that hard. Therefore, the correct choice is D. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part A with the first conversation. Number one. Carla said that you're rather rude. It's unfair of her to say that about me. What does the man mean? Number two. I don't think this painting is very good. It's better than the first one, isn't it? What does the woman say about the painting? Number three. Your graduation ceremony is this afternoon. I can't believe it. I've graduated at last. What does the man mean? Number four. I got this dress for only five dollars. Five dollars? How did you get it so cheap? What does the man mean? Number five. I just got my third parking ticket this week. Why don't you try putting more money in the parking meter when you park your car? What does the woman suggest that the man do? Number six. Were you able to get hold of the book that you wanted? I couldn't. At the bookstore, they told me that it wasn't available yet. What does the man mean? Number seven. Professor Mitchell's lecture certainly went on and on for quite some time. I thought he was never going to finish. What does the man imply about the lecture?
number eight. You don't have the notes from yesterday's physics class? No, I don't. Do you think I could borrow yours? What does the woman mean? Number nine. You said that you wanted to go shopping this afternoon. What do you want to get? I think I'd like to get my dad a new wallet for his birthday. What does the woman mean? Number ten. You didn't go into the pool even for a quick dip. I put my big toe in and decided that the water was too cold for me. What does the man mean? Number eleven. Do you know where your sweater is? I think I left it at my sister's house, but I'm not sure. What does the woman mean? Number twelve. I need for you to work on these new accounting reports. But I scarcely have time to finish the ones I already have. What does the woman imply? Number thirteen. How much longer do you think you're going to stay on that exercise machine? I give up. What does the man mean? Number fourteen. Look at those waves coming in. They're as huge as I've ever seen them. You can say that again. What does the man mean? Number fifteen. Are you ready for the political science exam today? I stayed up all night studying for it. Didn't you know that the professor put it off until next week? What does the woman mean? Number sixteen. I haven't turned in my schedule change form yet. Do you think that's a problem? You haven't turned it in yet. It's absolutely essential that you turn the form in immediately. What does the man mean? Number seventeen. I'd like to try on some rings, please. Do you prefer rings in gold or silver? Where does this conversation probably take place? Number eighteen. Look at this. You made an awful lot of long-distance calls last month. I called my family even more than usual. That's why the bill's so much higher than usual. What are the man and woman probably discussing? Number nineteen. What do you think of your new boss? I couldn't be more impressed with him. What does the woman mean? Number twenty. Mike, do you know when the recital starts? 
It starts at three o'clock, doesn't it? What does Mike mean? Number 21. If your tooth is hurting you so much, perhaps you should see your dentist right away. I don't really want to, but I guess I don't have much choice. What will the man probably do next? Number 22. I need to buy some stamps. Then you'd better get to the post office quickly because it closes at 5 o'clock. What can be inferred from the conversation? Number 23. Do you know how I can find the journal article that we're supposed to read for class tomorrow? The professor copied it and put it on reserve in the library. What does the man mean? Number 24. I really think you should try to be a little more calm. If I were any calmer, I'd be asleep. What does the man mean? Number 25. I don't think that news report can possibly be true. Neither do I. What does the woman mean? Number 26. Has management decided on a new policy for pay raises? It's still up in the air. I think it will be discussed again at the meeting next Friday. What does the man mean? Number 27. I can't believe it's snowing today. It wasn't exactly unexpected. What does the man mean? Number 28. How do you think you did on the literature exam that you had this morning? I really wish I could take it over again. What does the woman imply? Number 29. You didn't have to wait outside. You could have just opened the door and walked right in. So the door was not locked. What had the man assumed? Number 30. My guess is that you're leaving the office now and heading straight home. You've hit the nail on the head. What does the woman say about the man? This is the end of Part A. Go on to the next page. Part B. Directions. In this part of the test, you will hear longer conversations. After each conversation, you will hear several questions. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question 
and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Remember, you are not allowed to take notes or write in your test book. Now we will begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 through 34. Listen as a man and woman discuss a haircut. Hi, Bob. Your hair looks nice. It's a bit shorter than usual, isn't it? A bit shorter? I don't think so. It's a lot shorter. When I look in the mirror, I don't even know who's looking back at me. So you got your hair cut, but you didn't get the haircut that you wanted. This is not even close to the haircut that I wanted. I asked to have my hair trimmed just a little bit, and the hairstylist really went to town. When I looked down at the floor, there were piles of hair, my hair, on the floor. I couldn't believe it. Well, what did you say to the hairstylist? What could I say? The hair was already cut off. I couldn't exactly say, please put it back on, although that's exactly what I did want to say. Well, at least your hair will grow back soon. That's what everyone is saying to me. It'll grow back. It'll grow back. But it won't grow fast enough to make me happy. Maybe after you get used to it, you'll like it a bit more. Number 31. What seems to be true about Bob's haircut? Number 32. How does Bob seem to feel about his haircut? Number 33. What did Bob see on the floor? Number 34. What do people keep saying to Bob? Questions 35 through 38. Listen to a conversation about a man's great-grandmother. I talked to my great-grandmother on the phone this morning. Your great-grandmother? Do you talk with her often? I try to call her at least once a week. She's a really wonderful woman, and she's over 85 years old. I enjoy talking to her because she's so understanding and because she gives me good advice. What advice did she have for you today? <laughs> she told me to be careful because a big storm is coming. She said that a big storm is coming? Is she a weather forecaster? Not exactly. She says that she can feel it in her bones when a storm is coming. I know it sounds funny, but when she feels it in her bones that a storm is coming, she's usually right. That's not actually so funny. When people get older, the tissue around their joints can become stiff and swollen. Just before a storm, the air pressure often drops, and this drop in air pressure can cause additional pressure and pain in swollen joints. So when your great-grandmother tells you she thinks a storm is coming, she probably has some aching in her joints from the decreasing air pressure. Then I had better pay more attention to my great-grandmother's weather forecasts. Number 35. How often does the man usually talk to his great-grandmother? Number 36. What did the man's great-grandmother tell him on the phone this morning? Number 37. Where does the man's great-grandmother say that she feels a storm coming? Number 38. What will the man probably do in the future?
This is the end of Part B. Go on to the next page. Part C. Directions. In this part of the test, you will hear several talks. After each talk, you will hear some questions. The talks and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Here is an example. On the recording, you hear, Listen to an instructor talk to his class about painting. Artist Grant Wood was a guiding force in the school of painting known as American Regionalist, a style reflecting the distinctive characteristics of art from rural areas of the United States. Wood began drawing animals on the family farm at the age of three, and when he was 38, one of his paintings received a remarkable amount of public notice and acclaim. This painting, called American Gothic, is a starkly simple depiction of a serious couple staring directly out at the viewer. Now listen to a sample question. What style of painting is known as American Regionalist? In your test book, you read A. Art from America's inner cities. B. Art from the central region of the U.S. C. Art from various urban areas in the U.S. D. Art from rural sections of America. The best answer to the question, what style of painting is known as American Regionalist, is D. Art from rural sections of America. Therefore, the correct choice is D. Now listen to another sample question. What is the name of Wood's most successful painting? In your test book, you read A. American Regionalist, B. The Family Farm in Iowa, C. American Gothic, D. A Serious Couple. The best answer to the question, what is the name of Wood's most successful painting, is C. American Gothic. Therefore, the correct choice is C. Remember, you are not allowed to take notes or write in your test book. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 39 through 42. Listen to a talk by a tour guide in the Everglades National Park. Today we're going to be taking a tram tour through part of the Everglades National Park. Quite probably, we'll be seeing a number of crocodiles sunning themselves by the side of the water or poking their heads up through the water. Needless to say, we will not be getting off the tram at any time until we leave the area because of the danger posed by the crocodiles. By the way, you've probably heard of the expression crying crocodile tears. It is common to say that someone is crying crocodile tears when he or she is pretending to be sad or full of regret. Crocodiles always appear to have tears in their eyes, but they are not crying because of sadness or even pretended sadness. Instead, a crocodile uses its tear ducts to get rid of extra salt from its body. A crocodile does not sweat the same way that humans do and must get rid of extra salt through tears. So if you see a crying crocodile, do not think that it's feeling sad. It is basically sweating through its eyes. Look, over there on the right. There are two large crocodiles on the water's edge, right next to the fallen trees. You can get out your cameras and take pictures from here on the tram, but no, you cannot get off the tram to get any closer. Number 39. Where does this talk take place? Number 40. What does the expression 
crying crocodile tears mean when it is used to describe humans? Number 41. Why do crocodiles have tears in their eyes? Number 42. What does the tour guide recommend? Questions 43 through 46. Listen to the following lecture by a university professor. Please take your seats now because I would like to begin today's lecture. Today, we will be discussing one of the more elegant and distinct forms of 19th century transportation, the clipper ship. Clipper ships of the 19th century were the graceful, multi-sailed, ocean-going vessels that were designed for maximum speed. They were given the name clipper ship in reference to the fact that they clipped along at such a fast rate of speed. Clipper ships were constructed with a large number of sails in order to maximize their speed. They often had six to eight sails on each of the masts, and ships commonly had three and perhaps four masts. The speeds that they achieved were unbelievably fast for the era. Clipper ships could, for example, accomplish the amazing feat of traveling from New York to San Francisco in less than a hundred days. Clipper ships first came into use in the United States in the 1840s. They were originally intended to make the trip from New York around the tip of South America and on to China in order to transport tea to the United States. Once gold was discovered in California in 1848, clipper ships were immediately put into use to carry large numbers of gold prospectors and large amounts of mining supplies from the East Coast to California. With the success of the American clipper ships, the British began their own fleet of clipper ships to transport goods from the far reaches of the British Empire. That's all for today's class. Don't forget that there's a written assignment due on Friday. Number 43. In which course would this lecture most probably be given? Number 44. What is the most likely meaning of the expression, to clip along? Number 45. What were clipper ships first used for in the United States? Number 46. What does the professor remind the students about? Questions 47 through 50. Listen to the following talk by a drama coach to a group of actors. I know that some of you are feeling more than a little nervous about tonight's performance, and I want you to understand that this is quite a natural feeling. You are going to be on stage in front of a lot of people tonight, and it's normal to be experiencing some nerves. I would like to help you to understand these feelings and not let them interfere with your performance. What you are experiencing is called stage fright. Stage fright is the fear that develops before you give a performance in front of an audience. Stage fright is not experienced just by actors and actresses. It can also be experienced by musicians, athletes, teachers, anyone who performs in front of a group of people. It occurs before a performance when a performer is concerned about looking foolish in front of others. Just before tonight's performance, 
If you're feeling a bit tense, if your knees are shaking, if your stomach has butterflies in it, and if you are thinking about how bad your performance could be, then you have a major case of stage fright. To control stage fright, you can work to control both the physical reactions and the negative thoughts. To combat the physical reactions, you can try techniques such as deep breathing, muscle relaxation, or even just laughing to relieve some of the pressure. To combat the negative thoughts, you should force yourself to focus on what you have to do rather than on what other people are going to think. That's all I have to say for now. I'll see you back here at six o'clock because the performance starts at eight o'clock. Just remember that if you begin to feel at all nervous, try some deep breathing to relax and focus your thoughts on the performance that you are about to give. See you this evening. Number 47. Who would probably not experience stage fright in their work? Number 48. What physical reaction might someone who is experiencing stage fright commonly have? Number 49. How can someone combat the negative thoughts associated with stage fright? Number 50. When should the actors arrive at the theater? This is the end of Section 1. Stop work on Section 1. Turn off your cassette player.